Welcome to this audio session recording taken at the Agroforestry Show, which was organised in September 2023 as a partnership between the Woodland Trust and the Soil Association. For more session recordings, go to agroforestryshow.com or explore and subscribe to the Agroforestry Show YouTube channel. Enjoy! Everybody, uh, I'm gonna we're gonna kick off before people start wandering off. I think um, just gonna play a short video of um, Woodland Trust Wales did for the um, it's Will Evans, found from North Wales, really nice chap. He was here yesterday. Uh, if I press play, you know, I suppose as individuals make a difference, but when you've got access to land you can make a, a real difference. You can try to mitigate climate change, you can try and help with the biodiversity crisis, you can try and draw down carbon. And what I, what I don't want my children to do is grow up and say, what did, what did you do to try and help that? And I said, well, I, I don't, didn't do anything. Whereas I thought, if I can make these sort of small differences in the farm, and that's the beauty of something like Hedges and Edges, it isn't asking people to do anything massively different. It's just very small things that add up to something big. It was an easy win for us uh, and for the environment. It did, we didn't have to change any farming practices or do anything radically different. And also I got a huge amount out of it personally as well. When you plant a new hedge, it's not just the hedge. It's, you know, you walk along that hedge behind me now that I planted two years ago and you see all the butterflies and then you see the, the field mice that are running around in the bottom and suddenly we've got owls around. You don't have to be a, an ecological genius to realise the impact that has on, on, on so many different things. Farming is a long-term game. You know, you can't think about what we're going to do next year. You've got to think about what we're doing for the next generation. And if you believe in science and you believe in the way that the world is changing, you've got to start mitigating for that and making plans. We would not have planted all this length of hedge on our own, couldn't have afforded to. Um, so the financial support, um, but also having that advice was invaluable. Can't, I genuinely can't speak highly enough of, of Koi Kadu and the way they're supporting farmers and the way they make it easy. And also, dare I say, quite fun. It's nice to be a part of something. It's nice to work with people and get people back on farms and, you know, I, I've really enjoyed getting people here. I've had a few from my neighbouring farmers come and see what we've done and open their eyes a bit as well, hopefully. So, yeah, it, it's kind of a win for everybody. Uh, so good morning, everybody, and welcome to um, Hedges and Edges and Farmland Tree Session. Um, good to see so many of you here, uh, especially for those that were last night dancing in that tent. Um, there's a few bleary eyes, but it's not too bad. Uh, so yeah, so I'm, I'm James Robinson, this guy on the left, and then to my right, Ben Andrews, farmer from Herefordshire, Emma Bird from the Woodland Trust, and then Ruth Pibus from North Wales. Uh, so we're each gonna give a little bit of background as to our farms and what we've done on our farms and things, and then Emma's gonna give a background as to how uh, Woodland Trust can help with uh, getting um, hedges and edges of farmland trees. So I'm going to um, I'm going to give a brief outline of our farm and stuff. I'm just going to go through a few a few slides, and then once we've done all, and when we've, once we've done them all, we'll then uh, get on to some question and answer things. So yeah, hedges and edges are awesome. Uh, that is our farm. So our farm is in the is in the centre of that picture, really, just in, in into the left of the of the higher drumlin. Um, it's a, an interesting landscape where we farm, South Cumbria, uh, the sort of the low fell area um, that runs quietly down to, towards the sea. Uh, we farmed there for about 150 years, my family, uh, 1875, found the fifth generation, and then uh, we've got my son Robert, who's at home now, hopefully he's got milk this morning. Um, he's there uh, with my dad, uh, so we've got three generations working on the farm, the fourth, fifth and sixth generation. We're it's an interesting landscape mainly because of the sort of the, the topography. So we've got these, it's made up of drumlins. Uh, going back to your GCSE geography days, you probably haven't heard the word drumlin since, but it's, uh, yeah, sort of the rolling glacial formation of, uh, of, of a landscape, which was meant really because of the awkward, the awkward landscape, we've ended up with a lot of small fields and uh, 
as a result of that, a lot of boundaries, so we've got a lot of hedgerows. About seven miles of hedges on our 300 acres. We're all owned as well, so it gives us a nice, um, you know, it gives us the free reign pretty much to do what we want. But we've got seven miles of, of hedgerows, four miles of dry stone walls. The hedgerows are all managed in a traditional 20-year hedge lane rotation. Nothing is flailed within the farm boundaries at all, apart from on the roadside. So um, we are literally managing them on the same way that they would have done prior to the flail coming in, the tractor and flail coming in, which has meant we've really seen the benefits of wildlife and things. We've started doing, we've started that process really about 30 years ago. Previously to that, we were flailing some interior hedges and then leaving them to hedge lay every now and then. Um, we're lucky that we've got a river running through, we've got a beck running through called St Sunday's Beck, we've got wetland areas, hay meadows, ancient oak woodlands as well, and then we've then created some new ones, which I'll go on to describe it during my presentation. So yeah, so hedges and edges are awesome. And hedges are awesome, but they need management. So this one, this photo on the left, it's, um, we bought some land six, five, six years ago. And that hedge hadn't been laid in my dad's lifetime. He could never remember it being, la been laid. So this, this is basically next door to the old bit of the farm. We bought some, this land five, six years ago, and that had been probably about 70 years since it had been laid. So all, every one of those stocks is just a hawthorn stock. Um, every, everything else had died off in between. Stock obviously could just wander through. The hawthorn, the, probably the most resilient of all hedgerow species. Um, but even that was starting to die. You can see it's not exactly healthy looking. Uh, but um, the way we did re regenerate that was to coppice everyone off. Um, and I think two thirds of them were already dead anyways by then. They didn't regrow. Um, and then we've banked it up, replanted, fenced it up. And then within four years, sorry, three years, you get that, you get that there. So you can quickly restore a boundary. But the main problem is with doing that, is that you've lost all these ancient species, all that ancient um, DNA, as it were, from those from those old boundaries. You've lost all that old wood, so all these old cracks and everything. The, the loads of beetles and mice and things would have been would have been in among all that. That's all gone, but that's the only way that we could regenerate that hedge. So yeah, hedges are awesome, but they do they do need the management of them, just like any woodland does. And yeah, a hedgerow, a healthy hedgerow just benefits everything. There's nothing negative at all. So the shelter for the livestock, that's probably the number one importance for us, apart from the fact that it's a boundary between two fields. Shelter for the livestock and the shelter for the crop. And the crop doesn't have to be a valuable arable crop. It can be grassland. Grassland that is f uh, 40, 50 metres within a, within a nice, big, healthy hedge still benefits from the shelter and the shade that that brings and then the, um, and then the, the, the soil life as well underneath as well with the roots going underneath. So massive massive benefit really for the livestock and the crop wildlife corridor without these without these hedges that are linking up all our habitats that we've got the becks the woodland and the and the uh, the hay meadows and such um wildlife can't pass from one to the other so we're losing we're losing all that genetic diversity um from within uh, wildlife habitats natural food source as well so a natural food source for all the wildlife so the, the amount of stuff that is feeding on that is just absolutely phenomenal uh, but then they're also a natural food source for us as well. You know, there's all the nuts and there's all the fruit and things that we can benefit from. Um, one of the most important things for me, I think, is that they are part of our heritage, part of our identity. You know, it's hard to sort of imagine a landscape like ours in South Cumbria without the hedges. Same as around here, you know, you look across the landscape and you see all the, all the, all the boundaries, all the hedges. They're really part of the sort of the DNA, really, of British farming, really, these, these living boundaries, these hedges. And I think if you do ask someone from that would come in from, from, from another country, they would see these hedges as really part of that identity. So we've really got to look after them. And then our own well-being, you know, being among, being among wildlife, being in among these hedges, be it in summer or spring when you've got the blossom or in winter when you're hedge laying, it is just fantastic to be part of something that has been there for, in my case, four or five generations before. Um, but even if, you, even if you're just new to that land, just being able to, to manage something and then um, manage it for the future generations as well. My dad, uh, when we're hedge laying, he always says every year comes out with the same thing. We're not, we're not laying it for this, for, for this time, we're, we're laying it for next time. So you're always preparing, making sure that you are 
laying it to the, to the, to the best of your ability so as it's a better hedge to, to lay next time as well. <coughs> but, you know, sometimes hedges end up in a bit of a state. So you get this one like this on this left-hand side picture, 1993. That doesn't seem that long ago, but it, but it was. Um, so we ended up with a few hedges like that for one reason or another, which um, it's probably because uh, there was, uh, it was a graze field and young stock were grazing it and it was just managed, both sides of that hedge were managed the same. There was no fencing either side of it to protect it. So you end up with something like that, which, you know, looks like you couldn't ever make it into anything, but then you can see how quickly it can change. So with that, we were, we were hedge laying it with a chainsaw, with a digger. A lot of them were, were laying on the root. Um, so we're pulling big, big stocks over, trying to keep as much of that original wood and species in as we can. Um, where it was really bad, then we could just copy it off. Um, and then you end up like that middle picture where it's all of a sudden, you know, within, well, it's 20 years on there, but probably the, if there was a picture five years after that was laid, it would be a big bushy growth. So just by re rejuvenating a hedge, by getting it down, by ligging it, by um, using the chains or dig, whatever it might be, or coppicing, getting that new growth up, you can get a picture like that middle. And then we've ended up then laying it again. And, and every time we, we lay it now, it will get thicker and thicker and thicker just by managing it every 20, 25 years. And the beauty of doing that is you can make a hedge immortal. Some of these hedge plants that are in, in these, in these uh, boundaries of ours, you know, they're eight, 900 year old boundaries, um, since like the 1200s and stuff. Some of the hedge plants that are in there quite likely are the ones that were there when it was first established. They might not be in the same spot. Hedges can, by, the, by laying it, they can regrow in and they can actually sort of walk up a hedge as it were, by you know, every 20 years it might regrow in and then it might regrow in again. So some of those species and the actual, actual plant itself are quite likely to be the ones that were in there hundreds and hundreds of years ago. And that's why we should really look after them. So yeah, so just changing things on the farm, it doesn't have to be a hedge. Although I think a hedge is a, a fantastic way into a, um, you know, to um, agroecology, to agroforestry. It's just, it's an easy way in for a lot of people to make a real difference quickly. Um, but there's other things we can do as well so we can fence off becks that we've got. So this, uh, on the left-hand side here, um, that was our water source for our cattle down the bottom of our land. All pasture either side, it's been our water source for forever, you know, 150 years. Um, which is fine when there's like, you know, when there was herds of 15, 20 cattle, uh, which there would have been 100 years ago. Uh, now when we've got 150 cows going into that beck, there's a lot of, um, you know, they're obviously disturbing the banking a lot, you end up with um, uh, a lot of muck in there as well, which is, you know, water pollution. Um, you end up with soil contamination and loosening the, loosening the banks up so every time there's a flood, it, can, uh, it scours the banking out. Uh, there's no habitat there either, so there's nowhere that uh, wildlife and things can use as a corridor. So we fenced it off. Uh, our water source just, is just literally in behind the camera of that, uh, of that second one, uh, where we've got solar-powered water pumps. So we're still using that as a water source, but we're actually pumping the water out for the cows now. So we fenced it off with a grant from uh, Environment Agency. Um, they paid for the solar pump, they paid for all the fencing and everything. And if I was to take a picture now on that right hand side one, so it's a further year on, there's natural regeneration of alders coming to that bank inside now as well. We've got um, flowers in there that I've never seen, so we've got like fig warts and stuff coming up in there that I've never seen before, just by allowing things to, to grow rather than getting heavily grazed off. It, won't be, it perhaps won't be that we're going to fence it off and leave it fenced off for forever. We may end up managing it with cattle, but for probably for the first four or five years, we're just going to leave it fenced off and see what comes. Uh, we're, not, we're not going to plant any trees in. We're going to see what comes with natural region. So you can see there's some uh, gorse bushes, some, some wind bushes up here. So they'll, they'll probably end up coming back down into it a little bit anyways. And if the river wants, if the beck wants to find its own way in and cut into this side a little bit, move back towards the trees and we'll just let it. So we've, we've given it enough width to move on this side, which is the lower, the lower side. So yeah, so some changes can come quickly. So within a year, we've quickly got that. But then some take, yeah, a generation. Um, so this is a pond that was dug 1937, or in 1986 probably when it was done. And um, it was an area of wetland that was, it was no good for wildlife. It wasn't much good for, for agricultural land. Uh, it was a nice low line area next to a beck um, where field drains used to run down towards. It was just somewhere really that was good for fluke and not much else. 
Um, so fence it off. Um, my um, granddad's cousin had a um, like big plant, plant and stuff, so he came with a bulldozer. Within a week, they'd got this done. Um, that's my dad doing dad stuff with a drain. I don't know what he's doing. Um, but then quickly you get, you know, so within a generation, you can end up with that, like, that right-hand side picture. And I, and I love showing people. So it's a biggish pond. It's like two acres of water surrounded with um, six acres of newly planted woodland, uh, which now obviously looks like that right-hand side picture. And I just love showing people this to show what a difference you can make within your lifetime. But you need to do this at some point. You know, you, you, you'd be nice to be able to jump to that, but at some point you've got to start. You've got to, you've got to plant that hedge. You've got to plant a tree. You've got to fence off a beck. You've got to maybe do something. But just doing something now can, in theory, create something at the end there. So, yeah, some things, so that's me with me. I haven't changed a bit on that. Uh, that's me on my, I don't know, 10th, 11th birthday party. I've got more hair and less... Um, less stomach on that, but anyway. Um, so that there was where that pond was taken, where Dad was messing about with that drain. So Dad was messing about with that drain sort of just above my head, really. Um, so, yeah, it was in an area that was uh, fairly wet, just ordinary pasture, but fenced it off, took the pond and everything, fenced off where the, um, where the, where the pond surround was, which also included this beck, and then, um, yeah, that was last year. So... That's me stood in exactly the same spot, looking exactly the same, uh, apart from the red T-shirt. But you see all this, all this woodland. So a lot of that is natural regeneration that's just come in. So just allowing nature in, giving it space, you can create this habitat. And this now is a phenomenal habitat that is um, it's Atlantic rainforest. We've got, we've got about a quarter of a mile now that's all fenced off from stock. It's all closed canopy, or most of it's closed, closed canopy, with ferns, with lichens and it is just a fantastic spot to be. Um, but that has only been created within my lifetime. So it just shows that we can, if we just get on and do that initial thing, you can make a real difference. Thank you very much, I shall hand over to Ruth. Uh, good morning, everybody. My name is Ruth Pybus, and I'm farming in North Wales. I'm on uh, 70 acres. Um, 50 acres of that is quite recently planted, mixed mostly native broadleaf woodland, and it's being managed uh, towards being quality timber, uh, getting into a, a continuous cover system. I'd love to talk about really good woodland establishment. I'd really love to talk about converting brilliantly established woodland into CCF. I'd love to talk about timber. So I can't do that right now. Grab me during the show if those things interest you or take my card and get back in touch because there's just like so much great stuff to know about that. But for today, I'm talking, um, as with the other guys, I'd love to see James Farm. It sounds wonderful. We're talking about the benefits for nature by looking at our, the edges and trees within our, within our holdings. Um, so... On the left there, you can see two pictures of um, the farm where I live. So we're kind of looking across a valley um, at the front of the... Well, sort of halfway through those pictures, you can see this, like, obvious conifer tops. So they're on the opposite side of the valley from where we live. And it's uh, at the top of the picture with the house and the lane running through and the fields either side of the house. That's Bronhile Farm. And there it is in 1982, and there's, um, at that time, actually, um, we didn't own the land. We just had a, a house and a little paddock, and um, the rest of the land was part of a big estate, and it was pretty much sheep ranching, and there's some hedges there, but they were mostly fairly gappy, mostly sheep were getting at them, they were deteriorating, and very little woodland on the farm. Um, by 2013, you can see the picture below, uh, the hedges have been planted up or been laid. Uh, you can see that we've got, uh, you can still just about see the, house, the farmyard uh, towards the, the right of the picture. And we've kept a, a circle of fields around the farm buildings. But then around that, we've got a circle of, I mean, you could call it a small woodland, you could call it a generous shelter belt. Um, we've got this mostly native broadleaf woodland right around our farm. 
So the benefit of Strat, so what we've got, what we've still got is we've got our retained fields and there's our cows. So we've got um, a really small suckler herd. We've got uh, uh, four um, uh, uh, sort of mixed, sort of not particularly pedigree anything cows and have about four calves a year. Um, they're a closed herd, so we get um, uh, an artificial insemination service to make sure that we don't have to have our stock um, meeting any other stock. And the fact that we've got now this fantastic boundary, this field, but the, this treed boundary around our fields, mean that our animals don't have any nose-to-nose -nose contact with neighbouring fields and neighbouring livestock. So our neighbouring farmers increasingly are big dairy farmers with big dairy herds and increasingly they're having TB breakdowns which you really don't want. So we're feeling like really lucky that we've got this fantastic woodland that's sheltering our, our livestock from any disease outbreaks including TB but all sorts of other things that might be happening in those more intensive farms with more cattle movement, this sort of thing. And we have loads of badgers, actually, and no TB, fingers crossed. So part, partly our woodlands is giving us really great biosecurity on our farm. Um, the uh, cows there very obediently are in a field, and they're eating the hedges. And this is fairly typical. We see when we put our uh, cows into a new field, the first thing they do is they go and have a good chomp around the hedges, and they're finding sycamore and willow and wild cherry they go absolutely mad for wild cherry when the cherries are on the on the trees uh, you can pull a branch down and you get to see how long a cow's tongue is because they're <laughs> just reaching up in fact like, uh, a couple of years ago i found uh, in the summer i was like this in the middle of the field there's this like weird little patch of like cherry seedlings in the middle of the field and it was where the cows had been chewing cherries the previous year it left the cow pat and they started germinating uh, there they were yeah i love cherries so yeah so the cows don't just eat grass and i think this is something that regenerative farmers are trying to like put out there a lot we've had this strange thing where you have these like uh, rye grass and white clover and the cows eat grass the cows eat lots of stuff and they love the hedgerow trees and there's this fear of taking land out of productivity but actually you have a really good hedge a hedge that's managed in the sort of way that James has been describing lots of species allowed to grow out not getting flail smashed every year and losing all the fruit and the flower and the stuff that was great for wildlife but also allowing all that lovely lush growth that's just a vertical feeding paradise for your cows for your livestock really important so hopefully we've got healthier livestock because they've got really great feed and we've got our great biosecurity so hopefully we've got fewer vets bills so i was at the um the talk yesterday with sally ann talking about dung beetles fantastic so um she was talking about trying to encourage farmers to reduce their use of uh, insecticides, basically biocides, putting biocides into their land and um, uh, saying really you, should, you shouldn't be in a situation where you're putting these, these you know, poisons on your especially not adult cattle and um, I can say we ha the last time we put any sort of treatment on a cattle was one animal and it was in 2007. So this is about having healthy livestock. Instead of, I, I, and I have these conversations in forestry as well, where I do most of my talks, and we get people talking about all these problems that they've got with health and the things that they're having to do to deal with it. And quite often, it's the choices that we've kind of been forced to make, really, by all sorts of circumstances that are put in a situation where we're causing the problems. So actually focusing on health, whether it's in livestock or whether it's in our fields or whether it's in forestry, that's a really good start. And regenerative farming is trying to encourage us and give us the confidence, actually, to be brave enough to do things differently so that we can do healthy farming systems. Yeah, so as well as um, biosecurity, obviously those fields are giving us loads of shelter from our livestock. Um, if you look at the bottom photograph, uh, the furthest field you can see within the trees, over the top there, 
is where the northerly winds are coming from. So there's that lovely shelter from the northerly winds, from the worst of the winter weather. Um, in the hot weather, it's been really noticeable where the animals are. The animals are in the shade of whichever of those great hedges or that woodland edge is, is keeping them off the sun. And if you go into our neighbours' fields, who haven't been quite so enthusiastic about their hedges and woodlands, their livestock is in the shade of our hedges too, if they can, if they can get it. So we're kind of all increasingly hopefully aware that we're living in a climate catastrophe and a biodiversity crisis these things aren't newly known about. Rachel Carson was talking about um, biodiversity poisons getting right around the, the globe in the 1960s. The original research that showed that climate change was a thing that was caused by us burning fossil fuels was research that was which was um, commissioned by ExxonMobil, by one of the biggest uh, petrochemical countries. Again, back in the 70s, this stuff has been known about for years. We've been allowing this to happen for years. We've been walking into this complete death trap for years. We're finally waking up. It's maybe 30, 40 years too late to make it easy. This is going to be painful, but we need to do something about changing what we think normal is to try and achieve that health. And the first thing we have to do, which is really painful, is to admit to ourselves that our land isn't healthy. Our land is in a really bad state. We've been putting poisons on it. We've been plowing it. We've been maybe uh, pushed by all sorts of reasons, bureaucratic reasons, financial reasons, peer pressure reasons, to do things that really weren't great. Actually, things that weren't farming decisions or forestry decisions, things that were um, bureaucracies wanting to make management of land easy for the bureaucracy. You know, we're talking a lot about... Um, Here's a field and here's a tree. And we have farmers in conflict with forestry because these are two separate things, obviously. Well, no, they weren't separate things. But bureaucratically, it's much easier if you've got a field parcel and you can call that grassland and you get your grass codes, don't you, if you're in the farming industry. Uh, or on that woodland there, it gets a W code. Oh, and then you get, like, bracken or, like, gorse. And it gets this, I don't know, in Wales, we get the dreaded ZZs, which means you don't get any money. You know, so, so we've been told by bureaucrats how to manage our land because that simplified the land for them doing bureaucracy and doing payments. That wasn't a farming decision. It wasn't a farming decision to take trees out of that system. It wasn't a farming decision to take hedgerows out. Okay, so to some extent, as farmers, we need to forgive ourselves for all the things that have happened that have caused our lands to be sick, step back and uh, allow ourselves to think differently, but forgive ourselves. And we also need to be aware that we're hugely um, visible to our neighbours, and our neighbours are hugely visible for us, and that there's a lot of judgment and peer pressure within our farming communities, and that makes it really difficult to change. There are certain basic ideas that have been hard-grained, untidy hedge. I bet James has neighbours who says, that James, aren't his hedges a mess, yeah? People will say that. I'm sure my neighbours think my fields are horrendous. I'm massively understocked, obviously. Okay, so, uh, so we have a real problem, not just we, we need to recognise our land isn't healthy, we need to forgive ourselves for our past, we need to be resilient around the what our neighbours think of us and also be ready to see positive things that our neighbours are doing and be vocal about that to give them permission to think and do things differently. So here's healthy land. How do we recognise our hand land is healthy? Well, basically, we have loads of wildlife. So that's stuff that actually I put my hands up 10, 15 years ago. I felt a little bit nervous about talking about biodiversity because it was a little bit unserious and fluffy, and I like to think I'm very practical and pragmatic. Actually, this isn't fluffy stuff on the side, the way it's been put out there as you either get your basic payment or you can go into this other sort of farming where you get an agri-environment scheme. Actually, this... This is the health that underpins our healthy farming and forestry systems. And we need to start allowing ourselves to get really excited about the fluffy stuff. 
and the more, the more diversity we get, the better. We, the one thing that's very sick about our land is that it's been farmed or forested in very uniform ways. And what that does is means we don't have diversity. We don't have ecological diversity. If you have anybody giving you advice about how to manage your land and they're telling you what you need to do to deal with climate change is plant X sort of tree or do this sort of farming system across your site, then hold their advice with massive, massive suspicion. Because what you need to be doing on your holding is getting a diversity of landscape things going on, a diversity of foods being grown, a diversity of habitats, a diversity of products coming off, a diversity of jobs being created on your farm, because diversity is where we get resilience. Nobody can predict how the future is going to impact us, and the only way you can have um, some hope of dealing with what's going to hit you in the future is having diversity on your farm. It's the opposite of the way we've been taught to farm. So there's some of my diversity. I want there to be loads more. Oh, dung beetles. And it's worked. Look. Oh, it, there's one up there. Oh, there you go. I got some dung beetles on film and it worked. So this is the other thing, healthy communities. So um, I'm on 20 hectares of woodland. That's tiny. Because my woodland is really well managed, it's really diverse, the quality of the trees is really high. At 26 years old, we're already getting timber out to be planked. We've got too much work, my partner and I. We want to diversify this 20 hectare holding by getting more people on working on it. So this is about diversifying our rural communities. Our rural communities need not be uh, about a few monster farms and then a kind of a gentrified sort of leisure, sort of retirement village. That is not a healthy, diverse community. We need to get young people on our farms, and we need, we're doing a diversity of things with different products. Here, uh, bottom right, I haven't been told to whiz on. Bottom right is our um, uh, new to come bit of diversity on our farm. Uh, that piece of ecology is called Harriet Jenkins. Uh, she's 29 years old. She's going to be working with us starting October, thanks to an RFS, Royal Forestry Society, Forestry Roots Scheme. She's mad keen to learn how we do our forestry and to learn how to make different timber products. She thinks she's only staying for a year. <laughs> and she's going to be living in that little cabin in our woods, which um, some of the timber has come from uh, sawmill. Some of... Um, uh, imported, but a lot of the timber in that little cabin has come from the thinnings from a well-managed 26-year-old woodland, including ash and cherry, and it is a wonder to behold. So um, I, I got a bit distressed like, yesterday to hear people talking about getting trees on their farms and it being about not being too much work, and I think really that says more about um, the confidence of farmers to get into forestry and visualise what that's for than um, being about a lack of enthusiasm. I want to enthuse people to say that having a permanent, productive, quality resource is going to be brilliant for your community. So there you go. Healthy farmers. She really wants me to stop. Yeah, okay. Here, <laughs> Really great organisations to get beyond any negativity and isolation in your community. Nature Friendly Farming Network, absolutely fantastic organisation. Land Workers Alliance, young people enthusiastic about getting their hands dirty, not afraid of work, understand the land, really wanting to learn, like harness that resource. Ancient Tree Inventory, I've noticed they put some books out. I found like I, I have really been mentally ill on my farm, desperate about climate change and community and all this sort of thing. Uh, one thing I've done is like managed to find ways of just enjoying what's on my farm and the knowledge and the ancient um, woodland inventory stuff on the, on the Woodland um, Trust site is absolutely magic. Find, your, and find and love your ancient trees. Uh, likewise, big butterfly count. Find out where your butterflies are. Do you know what? They're on the ragwort and the creeping thistle and the bramble. Learn to love them. Um, the Merlin Bird ID discovered that app. Absolutely fantastic. You point it in the spring at your dawn chorus and it's telling you all what's in there. And it just lets you take a break from feeling overworked, anxious, desperate, and just say, here's what's beautiful in my farm. And then you can work to make it even better. So then, for the health of your livestock, your land, your community, yourself, your planet, embrace trees on farms. It is what's missing. Thank you very much.
Hi everyone, uh, my name's Ben Andrews. I'm an organic farmer from Herefordshire. We've been organic for 21 years now. Um, it, we've been farming in Herefordshire for, um, for sort of like, try looking back, and hundreds of years. Uh, we've moved about 50 miles, which isn't um, terribly adventurous, but we've been tenant farmers on, on the farm we're at at the moment uh, since the 1930s. We rent 450 acres um, off Brazenose College um, under an agricultural holding that tenancy. Um, it's old school mixed farm, um, beef, arable, veg, just started doing cut flowers. Super lucky with our soil. It's beautiful, medium, medium loam, so really productive. That mixed system lends itself well to, to being organic. Um, and we've got some, you know, on the one farm, we've got a couple of couple of cracking ancient uh, trees. So these these old oaks in the middle of the floodplain here, we fence those off from uh, livestock now. But those spend about six months of the year under about five foot of water. Um, so it's amazing they've really lasted this long. There's a power line that runs right past them, and Western Power were lobbing limbs off one of them. I don't know why they put them over there in the first place because they've not moved in quite some time. Um, but we were really lucky about uh, um, a couple of years ago to purchase 150 acres um, a bit further away from our, our main site, uh, which is, I say, up in the hills, but, but it's still probably practically sea level compared to James's farm. Um, we, uh, as you can see, these are, this is like an old tithe map, um, and, and this is the, um, the field boundaries as they are now. You can see the field boundaries themselves are pretty much unchanged. I mean, you've got you know, all the same, the same, um, the same hedges. Got some ancient woodland up the top there, which is thinned out a bit. And what we want to try and do is to to relink some of um, some of that ancient woodland at the top with some of this woodland um, that's right down at the bottom on our on our neighbour's land. Uh, we've got some cracking trees up there, um, some real amazing diversity, but um, ash dieback is taking its toll. And you can really see that um, so here's some, some, of the, some of the trees up there. You've got, um, yeah, like older coppice, um, sort of like um, ash pollards, like these laps ash, ash pollards, and all these trees, they were all part of, um, it was all managed, you know, trees weren't just like, they're just doing their thing. They've um, they've all been part of a, of a managed farm landscape. As you can see, you know, I call it parkland. It sounds a bit grand, doesn't it? But it's just some some big trees, sort of like dotted throughout throughout the field. But yeah, these these big old great ash pollards. Those would have been like had those limbs lopped off ages ago, and that, that ash would have been used for something. But but now they're um, yeah they 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 could do with a, a bit more management. And one interesting fact I learned at the Oxford Real Farming Conference was that if you have these open trees, um, ashes, where you've got, you've got wind that will, can blow the falling leaves away, or you've got livestock underneath them eating those fallen leaves, it can actually help against the ash dieback because the, the, the fungus on the leaves um, falls to the floor if they're allowed to decompose and get into the roots, and which can can damage the uh, damage and eventually kill kill the trees. Hedgerow trees. I mean, I, my hedges are nowhere near as uh, as sexy as James's and Ruth's. But um, this top left is a new hedge that we put in as part of the environmental stewardship scheme um, about just over ten years ago, and it has yeah, it's been absolutely thriving. So unfortunately, we like, it's got a footpath that runs right along the side of it, so it doesn't really allow us um, much gap for leaving, leaving grassy, grassy edges. But it, up through those hedges, as well as the, the hedgeland species, you've got knapweed, um, ladies' bed straw, um, uh, oxide daisies, scabious that are just just there i didn't plant them they've just like turned up from from somewhere so there's so much stuff actually in the soil um but loads of our hedges especially on the new farm need a lot of work there's a lot of coppicing to do it's quite daunting um but but we'll we'll get there get there eventually and there are opportunities under the the new um sfi scheme which we're gradually starting to see some sort of clarity on but um 
hopefully that that sort of incentive to to you know, monitor the condition of and um, improve the condition of of hedge trees and having some funding because because it is it's another expense that like, you know that you know it's as if I'm got enough to do on the farm without having to go and um, sort of coppice and, and lay another uh, another you know five six miles of hedges. Um, but the, uh, all these ancient trees on the farm, they don't have to be big. This is probably my favourite tree. It's a little field maple. Um, I think one of the best things about integrating livestock into, into um, sort of woodland uh, and, and, and see the, yeah, the cows and trees, agroforestry, is the way in which the, the stock will um, they'll browse and lift the, uh, the skirts of the trees. It allows a little bit more light in underneath and just helps to, to improve the, uh, like the, the, the shape of them. Um, but what I mainly wanted to talk about is the, the life um, that we see in the trees. Now, I, um, I didn't know anything about birds until about three, four years ago, and then COVID happened. And I was walking around the farm, and I realised I didn't actually know what any of the birds were. I knew that we were, I knew that we were, we were doing this, all this stuff for, for birds, but I, I genuinely couldn't tell the difference between a, like a, a hedge, a hedge like you know, a normal sparrow and a and a, a you know a high sparrow and a tree sparrow or a um, I don't know what a linnet was. I mean, like I'd heard of them. I knew we were doing this wild bird seed mix for linnets, but I mean, like, what's it? What, what does it actually look like? So I got I'd always been into photography, got a longer lens, started taking photos, and then going back to um, to the house, load them onto the computer, open the RSPB bird book that I'd had since I was about five, and tried identifying some of the birds, and it's. Um, it's really satisfying to see that you know, when you look them up on the RSPB website, to see how many red list species there are. And it really starts to, to concern you to realise, oh, you know, these, these birds, you know, like, these were once in my bird book, they were not down as red list species of birds 30 odd years ago. But now they're seriously declining. And, and you know, you've got to, to realise that you know, there are some birds that rely very much on certain types of tree like these um, lesser red pole and the siskins up here they love the older they're, they're always always in it um, and just like chatting away there I don't know if they're having a fight or whether they're just like you know chewing the cud or whatever but um, and then uh, uh, yeah and then chiff chaffs just like just we've got little little um, willow all the way down the all the way down the river banks they're constantly chattering away in there um, and you've got birds that use it for different things. So you've got you've got tree creepers. Um, they'll just be like just desperately trying to find find some snacks in that in that in that bark. Got a buzzard that just so lazy. People like, people worrying that buzzards are gonna like take all the the small birds. That, you know they don't really want to get anything faster moving than an earthworm. Um, but he's <laughs> just like just biding his time waiting. And then. Probably one of my favourites, um, the, uh, the the spotted flycatcher. Um, he they love um, woodland glade areas. So we've got a little family of them in our in our one um, woodland, and there's nothing I like more than just going and sitting on a log and just watching, um, just watching them fly around. And they're 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 not that nervous, and they'll get quite close. Um, and it's yeah, again, really satisfying to see. And then better killer over there, sparrowhawk. Um, incredible watching those watching those in uh, in flight. Sort of one catch a pigeon, take a pigeon down out of midair, and it's yeah, it's incredible. Um, so more birds, uh, yeah, more pictures of birds relying on hedges, trees, um, little stone chat, bullfinches, all these things that yeah, field fairs. Like I didn't realise, yeah, field fairs. I thought they yeah, field fairs, red wings. Thrushes, like I could not have told the told you the difference between them about three years ago. But when you see that they are all different and they all do feed in slightly different ways, but they will all flock together. Um, there's a little white throat there up on on one of our hedges, which just I remember hearing this bird was walking down a hedge and I heard this bird just like yeah, just wobbling away, chatting away, and I was just like, what is that? I don't, I like, don't recognise what that is. And it's before I discovered the Merlin app, because that is a great app, if anybody hasn't got it. 
Um, and just just like tiptoeing tiptoeing down, just trying to trying to see if I could find it. And and there he was, just like perched atop, um, having a right old chat. And then um, far right, it's a bit of a dark picture, but yellow hammers. Um, and you see them on a brown hedge, and you wonder whatever sort of evolutionary um, idea went on there to sort of like have a bright yellow bird on a brown hedge. Um, but again, those are birds that they don't actually love massive hedges about two meters they like to just like and, and like pop over um bob over them but yeah lovely lovely little birds to see um so yeah the the ancient trees we've got on our farm i think one thing that i think probably all notice is that uh, we've got all these incredible old trees but there aren't that many medium aged trees so we are um doing a bit of both with natural regeneration. Uh, this on the left is yeah, some oaks that are, yeah, we've got, um, it's like a, a dingle down to the right hand side where those oak trees are, which is probably the most nature rich part of the farm. Put my little wildlife camera down there and we get, we get um, like a wild, it definitely wasn't a pine martin and it definitely wasn't a polecat and it looked like a wild ferret but i know there aren't wild ferrets but it's just one that someone's obviously like lost down a rabbit hole somewhere um but yeah foxes badgers it's almost like they perform for the camera sometimes uh so we're just leaving leaving some of these um we're not grazing that gonna leave some of those saplings to get a bit stronger put some put some guards around them uh, and then hopefully we'll get some some magnificent oaks uh, like you see in the background uh, in the future. And then some more on the right. Those are some that we've planted uh, just again to, as I said, about linking up that bit of woodland that we've got um, to the south of the farm and up to the north. Um, but one of the really important things is it's all about the right tree in the right place and some birds really don't like trees so this is a lapwing chick that we've got we have lapwings nesting on one of our fields and it's always specifically been one of our fields and we used to have loads hundreds down there but in we haven't really changed our farming practices and in the um last 30 years we've seen a massive decline in the numbers there and the only thing that has changed really is our neighbours the other side of the river um, put up a massive poplar plantation which is now home to several thousand jackdaws uh, which are big predators of um, ground nesting birds now lapwings are if anyone's seen them they are good at seeing off predators but you need that critical mass of lapwings to be able to to manage um, sort of the, the predation from such a great number of birds. So I don't really know what our answer is to, to, to um, tackling them because it's far more than we can really manage uh, you know, in any, any reasonable way. But by putting scrapes and, and having, this, um, having um, the lapwing nesting plot through the countryside stewardship scheme, um, it allows, uh, it gives them a little bit of habitat and allows them to, to thrive. And they actually seem to do better down there um, when we've got cattle in there than, than when we don't. So it's a nice little symbiosis. But yeah, um, and I'm sure you've all heard you know, about the, the um, I think when I looked at Woodland Creation Grants previously, a lot of them, it was, and I think like Ruth was saying, it's like, well, you can either, you can either do woodland or you can do farming and you can't do both and if you do woodland then you've got to take it out of agricultural production so now a lot of these new grants are allowing you to do agroforestry which is not a new thing um let's face it you know agroforestry is was totally normal um and it's just we've forgotten to do it as we go down this idea of we have to do 100 percent of this or 100 percent of that um so yeah just like, like takeaway like from this with with the birds is that i think if i hadn't gone out and identified the birds on our farm i wouldn't have known if they weren't there any longer um and i think you need to you need to know what's out there because you know they're saying you, know, you don't know what you've got till it's gone well if you don't know what it's it, what's there in the first place and you're not going to notice when it is gone um so yeah that's uh that's it. thank you Uh, hello everyone.
everybody. Uh, I am Emma Bird. I am uh, Agroforestry Project Manager for the Woodland Trust. Um, I don't own a farm. I don't live on a farm. Um, but I cover the whole of the UK with my role. Um, so I am here today to talk to you a little bit about what the Woodland Trust can do to help uh, farmers, uh, landowners, land managers um, in terms of advice and funding. Um, to help you create something along the lines of what uh, James, Ruth and Ben have got on their farm, okay? Um, so we will start with um, more woods, okay? So we're here today to talk a little bit about hedges and edges um, on your farmland. Um, more woods is a small scale woodland creation scheme, okay? So we're talking about an area of about half a hectare upwards in total on your farmland but could, that can be broken down into smaller blocks so you could be creating little shelter belts and things like that that might help benefit you and your farm okay and all the benefits that have been mentioned already here today and the way it works is that we subsidize the costs to you um, and one of our advisors would come out to your site and talk to you in detail about site preparation species mix establishment um, management, all those sorts of things, protection that's suitable for you, um, what your motivations are for planting those trees, and what's important to you, um, and what's going to help you. And that's the really key thing, I think, with everything that we offer is that, is that advice side of it. Um, and I know that's a big thing that's going um, in discussion at the moment with the government grants, is, is there going to be funding available with in terms of advice going forward as well. Um, and you know, even if you didn't follow through with any of our schemes, that advice would still be free of charge. Um, so with More Woods, um, it's up to 75% funding from the Woodland Trust, and that covers your trees and your protection. And that would be you planting and maintaining the trees. Um, and as, as I say, that's UK wide. And if you want more information about any of these schemes today, um, come and talk to us on the Woodland Trust stand um, and, or uh, on your seats. You should have a little leaflet that will give you more information about them and get in touch with us, OK? Um, perhaps more specifically in terms of hedgerow creation today, uh, we've got our more hedges scheme. Um, so this is to, the idea behind this is creating new hedgerow um, and creating wildlife corridors. So either connecting, say, hedgerow to hedgerow or hedgerow to woodland or something along those lines. Um, minimum at what lengths would be 100 metres. Um, and if you're not creating additional woodland as well, then you would be allowed a maximum of 250 metres. If you're planting woodland as well, then we would allow you to plant more than that. Again, the similar costs. Um, yeah, so the costs work in the same way in that um, it's, uh, we subsidise 75% of the costs for uh, the plants um, and the protection that comes with that. And uh, there are several different mixes that you can pick um, in, terms of, in terms of that. Um, you don't actually get a, an advisor come out to your site with the hedgerow um, but we can give you advice um, in terms of our website or emails or phone calls and things like that okay um, and then uh, trees your farm which is one that I'm probably more um, involved in myself so this is a kind of more um, innovative um, agroforestry scheme um, it's more competitive and this is about the complete integration of um, the trees and your farming system together. So whether it be a kind of silver arable system or a silver pastoral system, it can be all sorts of things. We've, we've seen all sorts of weird and wonderful designs across the 10 years that we've been doing this funding now. Um, and it might it's the idea is that it's a commercial, always a commercial farm, and that you're demonstrating both in environmental and economic benefits. Um, it might purely be something like a riparian scheme, um, planting for um, ammonia emissions, 
or it might be that you're planting strips of um, apple trees in the middle of an arable field, something along those lines. Um, so, um, and we have a design clinic, um, which is located between the Woodland Trust and the Soil Association here today. And if you wanted to speak in more detail, uh, if you had any ideas about uh, what you might want to do on your farm, because these, some of these agroforestry schemes are a little bit more complex, then you can sign up for a <laughs> slot to talk specifically about that. Um, hedgerows and woodland creation can be a little bit more simpler, but again, if you wanted to talk about those, you'd be more than welcome to sign up for a slot at the design clinic as well. Uh, all of these are in the leaflets on your seats. Um, and yeah, by all means, come and chat to um, us on our stand about them um, or, or get in touch with us. The details, as I say, are in the leaflet. Um, that was a quick whiz through from me because I think it's very much more important that you talk to our speakers. So I'll hand over to James now for the Q&A. All right, thank you. Morning, thanks for that. Um, anybody who can make me uh, nod vigorously with this kind of hangover, is, uh, it must be a pretty good talk. Um, I'm Kate Hughes, I'm from Wood Advent Farm on Exmoor. We have um, 500 acres of uh, what I guess you'd still call regenerative, I prefer agroecological. Uh, we run woodland, wood pasture. Um, our hedge trimmer blew up three, uh, about three, 30 years ago and we didn't have the money to replace it, so our hedges are 10 metres deep. Our, I was interested to, to hear what you were saying, Ruth, about um, uh, about your um, TB, lack of TB. We haven't gone down with TB since we weren't a child's drawing of a farm. Um, our neighbours, however, still look like child's drawings of farms. Um, I would really like to hear what you guys' responses are to the only language that my, my neighbours seem to speak, which is yield, dead weight carcass condition, that kind of thing. How do you speak to them in terms of um, productivity on your farm? Acknowledging that if you're standing in a, a field in 30 degrees, you absolutely know that, that the natural position and the food production position are fundamentally interlinked. Yeah, um, yeah I'll, I'll fire off with that. And so we've been, um, yeah, we've been the odd ones in the, in the village for quite a while, I think. Uh, been organic for 20 years, which I didn't actually mention up there. Uh, been on stewardship schemes for 30 years um, and only now are our neighbours starting to do different so um, we've created a bit of wetland and stuff which came through funding with the environment agency neighbours wanted to know where we got the funding for the digger and for the fencing all that sort of stuff once they see stuff happening then they're keen to do the same and they want to sort of um, if it's somewhat free, they want, they want that for start. So that's why the, sort of the free tree advice is great because people want something for now. But if there's, if there's funded fencing, funded trees, whatever it might be, then they're keen to do that. Um, but I, you know, I think really to make the biggest change of all, it's still going to come down to the market. And if the market demands, be that um, milk buyers demand that you've got to manage your hedges in a different way, that you've got to um, be mindful when you're using wormers or whatever for, to support that, then it, it, has to, it has to come from that end. But that's nothing to say that we as landowners that want to make a difference can't get on and do that and hope that their neighbours and, and people that drive past want to make that change as well. And don't forget that we are, as farmers, we are, um, we're always advertising. We're always... Um, if we own anything that involves someone walking past or driving past, we are advertising what we do as an industry. Um, so if we are flailing hedges into oblivion every, every on the 1st of September every year, then people see that, people comment, people make a judgment on that as well. Um, and they may or they may not use that to, um, to support their buying choices. So um, we have a choice individually to make a difference and we have to hope that other people do that as well. Um, <laughs> Telling people what to do never works, does it? We have to encourage them. So that's just my take on it anyways. Yeah, I mean, you're dead right. We need a change in the conversation. And I think one thing I say to people is that the, um, I don't take uh, to heart too much 
the things that I hear farmers say to me because I think 90% of what we say is just we're social animals and we want a positive social response and people are saying the same things that they know that normally give them a, a, a positive response. So they're talking about I'm feeding the nation and I've got to run my business. And so in terms of the feeding the nation thing, it's, well, actually our farming industry is consuming vast amounts of food. You know, and I know we, we don't feed our cattle anything other than uh, grass that's coming off our land, but our neighbours are feeding a huge amount of what is people food, and it's coming from around the world. And they even know it. They even know it. But we've still got this, like, um, public conversation going on where the NFU, for example, can say that, and it's not challenged. And partly, I guess, that's around um, various of us being prepared to stick our necks out and speak out, and that's not to um, get at our farming neighbours. I think they're in a trap. Um, it, it's just to allow those voices to come out and to, for us to stand back and get away from those kind of... They're almost like instinctive responses to something that's been said, I'm, I'm feeding the nation. So there's this big push, isn't there, to get as much produce out of the gate. But it's not productivity, it's conversion. You might as well be on a factory floor, which is ridiculous because what actually we are in the farming and forestry industries is very most fundamentally we are producers. The sunlight comes to the ground, it uses the natural fertility and the water resource, whatever, of the land, and it's all for free, and it produces something in the very most fundamental ecological way that we are a part of, and we need to get back to that. Um, a big thing that uh, um, James is massively involved with Nature Friendly Farming Network. I discovered you guys about a year and a half ago, and I just found it. I was in tears. I discovered their website, and one thing they've got on there uh, is farmers' stories, and they have little podcasts where they talk about farmers and they talk about their journey from their, um, I guess, sort of standard uh, agricultural model to converting to regenerative uh, farming. And in the case of uh, livestock, it's generally been about reducing their livestock levels. Massively brave. It did bring their, like, to, like did reduce the amount that was coming out their gate but it increased the uh, economic viability of their farm because so much of what was increasing that uh, was sort of squeezing out that little bit more out of the gate, a little bit more out of the gate, was inputs that weren't actually getting a return. So, uh, and so there, there's a lever there is saying, look, economically, you can be doing better if you have less livestock because actually you're getting back to the natural productivity level of your farm and they're going to reduce their stress levels they're going to be more um you know we've had these horrible shocks haven't we around food prices and fuel prices you know we can talk about that being because of the ukraine war or brexit whatever you like basically all these things run like underlined by the fact that we've got a climate crisis you know uh, yeah, we have wars because we have resource shortages you know our big world leaders recognise that, trying to get their hands on it, you know. So, so, so you've got that lever, if you like. And I think we all just need to start gently drip-feeding these messages in. We need to hassle the big voices like the NFU, because really, they know all this stuff, and it's wicked that the, with all the media attention they have and the ears that they've got, that they keep putting those messages out. They're a massive barrier. Hi, Philip Denalik. I'm a retired accountant. I've got 30 acres, um, and I had love trees. I also expect people to reply to letters. So when I've written to the H HMRC, um, Forestry Commission, and DEFRA three times in the last three months with absolutely sod all response, all my question is, is how big's a spinny? <laughs> how tricky can this be? Either there is an answer to that question, or it's lost in the, in the realms of history. But they could say, sorry, you can't answer, or it's five miles long. I don't know what the hell it is. Why do you want to know how big a spinny is? So if you get the answer wrong. This is it. So here's the other thing that impacts why we do what we do with our land. The other thing that's not a farming decision is it's an accounting decision. Yeah. So. Hi there. Uh, Gareth Phillips, Head of Forestry Development for Scottish Forestry. I was just wondering in terms of the agroforestry sort of projects and the funding there, yeah. is that an either-or deal in terms of getting public funding or going with yourselves for getting agroforestry? Or is there a a sort of more bespoke service that could be offered there. For example, you could do the facilitation part at the beginning, then get some state funding, perhaps a top-up from yourselves, and then 
you help with the implementation? So basically, if you, if you were to get in touch with us, one of our advisors can come out um, to you and then they would advise you on what is best in terms of funding. So if there is, for example, some government funding that might be better suited to you, um, or depending on what f farm subsidies you're already claiming, they will work out what you can and can't um, apply for from the Woodland Trust in order for you to um, not get into trouble, basically. Or they will advise you as a, who to get in touch with to make sure that you don't, um, we don't double fund, okay? Because we, we can't, you can't claim, you can't claim Woodland Trust funding um, most of the time if you're already claiming funding from the government for something. Not most, most of the time. Not, not always. Yeah, so it, most of the time we, you, you can't double fund if, we, if you're claiming for um, us as well, no. So we, we, it would be either or, yeah. Um, yeah, I was just wondering with the hedge lane, particularly on your farm, James, where it's been going on for quite a while, whether it's you and your family and people on the farm that are doing the laying or whether you're getting contractors in uh, to do that and whether it's just off your own back uh, time-wise or whether it's paid for work. Uh, all our hedge lane is done by me, my dad and my son. Uh, well, it is now. Um, and I think that's one of the good things about it. So it's a real generational thing. Um, we're doing hedges now that we know... You know, we look at diaries from like 1930s and 40s and they were laying the same hedges then. Uh, we probably lay hedges three times in our lifetime. So my son's doing them for the first time now and he's 19. Um, I'll do them once more and dad probably won't do them again. Um, you know, he's only 75, he's not on death's door, but I think he's probably not going to be laying hedges when he's, um, when he's 100, but you never know. Um, uh, we do it all. We don't, we don't pay for contractors. Um, the hedges that we do, the, you'd have a job of probably getting contractors to want to do them. There's a lot of new hedges planted at the moment, so they're very keen to get their £12 a metre or whatever they're going to charge um, from, from a new hedge where they can do 100 metres in a day sometimes, you know, if, if there's two of them. So, um, whereas our hedges, it's, you know, it's probably more likely to be sort of 25, 30 metres in a day. Um, but we see that as a benefit to us. We get the money from the stewardship schemes that we're on. So uh, we've always been in stewardship schemes from 19, uh, 1991. The first scheme that we got into was uh, it was a hedge incentive scheme. So it was the first farm-wide one that was, uh, that was uh, out and about then. Um, and it really, really did get us to improve every single one of our hedges then. And then it's been a constant cycle ever since, ever since that time. Um, so we're getting paid to lay them. We get paid to fence them, which is just as important as the actual laying, you know, to actually protect them, uh, to allow all that new growth to come up. Um, and then the big, so when we're doing it, the sort of, uh, you know, they are six, seven, eight metres high and wide by the time we get to laying them. So we get the substantial preparation payment as well from government, um, which I think now with that and the hedge laying, I think it comes to £20 a metre, £21 a metre. Um, so it adds up now, you know, it, it becomes worthwhile. Um, it's always been worthwhile for us anyways. So we're going to get paid for doing stuff that we would have done, but um, it becomes worthwhile for people to, to actually change the management now, I think. Um, I'm Nigel Pugh, the campaign lead for Woodland Trust in Wales. Um, we're campaigning on the sustainable farming scheme, and we have a 10% tree cover target proposed within that sustainable farming scheme. Um, hedges are precluded from that 10% tree cover. Do you think they should be included within that 10% tree cover? Yeah, I'll fire on. Even though I'm not from Wales, I think I'm probably allowed an opinion. Um, I'll, I'll give it anyway. <laughs> I'm not. Uh, I've added up our. So I said we've got like um, we've got seven miles of hedges, ten thousand metres, pretty much of our of uh, hedgerow on our farm. If you were to lay them all side by side across a field, as it were, touching, I think it's about eleven or twelve acres of hedge, of canopy of cover that we've got. Um, so we're about three to four percent of our farm is. You know, if you want to call it tree cover, it's tree cover just from hedges alone. And if the Welsh Government want to get trees on fire and they want to improve, improve the actual tree cover, I think number one would be to include hedges, because you know, to improve the management of hedges anyways. So if you're allowing to grow big and you're allowing to grow bush and you're, you're, and you're managing them in that, in, in that correct way, then why shouldn't it? I just, it does seem a bizarre. quality of hedge. 
change. Yeah, absolutely, a absolutely. Not a flail thing that's a, you know that's about two foot high and is all gappy and and and, uh, and just just smashed wood every year. If it's a well managed hedge that qualifies for whatever, you know, if it's managed in that in that correct way, um, then it absolutely should be. And then you can include, you know, you you can include extra things for uh, for trees and hedges as well, which are vital important that we do. Uh, but yeah, that's just my opinion from over the from over the border. Uh, yeah, I, I also think that the um, you know, again, I'm literally right on the border uh, with Wales and and drive through it quite frequently and and. It's you know, having spoken to some friends o over the border, I, I know that it's um, you know some farms it's a lot easier to get that ten percent that ten percent cover on than than others. Um, so as James said, I think the quality of a hedge, I think a good quality hedge is always going to be far more beneficial than um, putting in a load of trees and then not being maybe maintained terribly well and just paying lip service to a to a box ticking exercise. I also think it's, like it's an easy way in. It's an easy way in for a lot of farms to make a change to, you know, to, to join in the agroforestry. Agro agroforestry it's just a better managed hedge because generally they are there in some way or another. So I think it's an easy foot on the ladder, as it were. Yeah, I am in Wales. <laughs> so, I am in Wales. So I think there's a real problem if we put out there that there's going to be this 10% trees on farms and then we start finding reasons for uh, excluding different they'll make it e make it so easy to achieve that it doesn't actually give any motivation for chart farmers to do anything it's like oh yeah here's another situation where we go you have to have 10% trees on farms that sounds great that sounds big oh but we'll let this and we'll let this and we'll let this and oh nobody has to do anything that's great we've got 10% trees on farms you know there's loads of that goes on I think it's a fantastic ambition. I think for a lot of, you know, we don't have this sort of landscape in much of Wales, quite a lot of it. Um, we, we already have quite a lot of trees. That's great. I think um, the first thing we can do, I mean, hedgerows is a separate thing. I think encouraging farmers, I mean, I, I, the last I heard, possibly hedgerow trees were going to be involved in, included in that canopy cover, which is great. Um, uh, and I think the other thing is, like, I keep banging on about this, but I, I really think that what we've got isn't really the, ne the, 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 the result of the decision-making of farmers with farmers' heads on. It's been a response to government stuff. You know, that we, we've historically ripped out hedges and, and field trees um, because government policy has asked us and even paid us to do that. The most recent awful thing that happened in Wales is that um, there was, so, so anybody that's not in farming, your farm's like all maps, there's all your fields, they've all got field numbers, they've got crop codes and they've got um, an area. And there was um, the threat of some remapping exercise that would mean any overhanging branches and canopy over your field edges would be mapped out because you get payment on your field and you don't get payment on your woodland. So all of a sudden, these god-awful machines, these tree shears, which are just like uh, tree um, injurers, that became very popular to go around all the fields and take off all the overhanging branches to hit the beautiful like old field trees, take off the overhanging branches to reduce the canopy cover. So, you know, uh, that's what farmers did in response to even just like some hearsay about what was going to happen in government. So if the flip side happens, actually, yeah, you're going to get farmers squealing about, oh, we don't want to do that. But actually, farmers are constantly doing what they're being told they're going to get money for and they will do it. So so as um, an advisor to landowners around woodland creation, you know, while we hear in the press all this um, kind of angry voices about this 10%, how stupid it is, personally, I hear farmers coming to me saying, oh, uh, I'm just thinking, I'm going to have to have this 10% woodland and I'm a bit worried because um, um, I need some help on how I'm going to achieve that. And I think if we can make sure there's good advice out there and keep putting out positive messages about trees, you know, actually... Yeah, it's a scary thing for farmers. They don't know about trees. You know, we can win them over. I don't think there's a problem. I've even written a planting scheme for a local Welsh farmer. It's giving him his... He's done the bare minimum. You need to... Well, you needed two hectares at the time to be in the scheme. He's put it on a field where nobody can see it. So it's not being, and nobody's going to see like this neighbour thing, apart from one neighbour who's quite regenerative. Um, so 
but it's there, you know, he's going to be planting it next winter. So I think don't get too anxious about what's being said out there because people are having different conversations behind closed doors and actually we have the landscape we have because of government policy and, governments and government um, funding. And maybe the first thing we need is for government to say, sorry, I'm really sorry about all the things we made you do. Really sorry of causing this confusion about making you do something else. But please, if we can give you the support, if you can tell us what you need to buy into this, we'll help you. So yeah, I don't think we should start be looking for little bits and bobs to like, throw into that to water it down. Hi. Um, f following on from um, the lady from Exmoor's Kate Hughes question and neighbours and the discussions, um, natural capital, valuation of natural capital, putting these things on the balance sheet, um, one, is there a mechanism to do it? Um, I've got a small regenerative farm in Jersey. I'm actually having to spend about 90% of my time to protect my own trees and hedges from neighbours because of all the things you've touched on. And I'm actually take, thinking about taking some legal cases now to actually do that. So I'm wondering if it's not a way I want to do things, but they are. Yeah, there's been discussions in the past about monetizing these things. Is it a way of getting through to people? Um, and can you help me on that with what I need to do with potential legal actions? Um, me personally, I probably can't, uh, can't advise at all on that. Wait, um, anyone that I've ever spoken to has said whenever you're doing anything, be that um, planting a hedge, creating a wetland, planting a wood, or I do a biodiversity survey at day one, which I've never done yet, which is horrendous. We've done all these changes on our farm, and every everything is anecdotal. <laughs> I could tell you. Um, so yeah, day one, find out what's there, and then you can at least show improvements because there's a chance, and it maybe is just a chance that biodiversity credits payments can be backdated. You know, so if you can show that you have done X in the last three years, um, you've got I don't know, five more pair of lapwings nesting. You've uh, you've got. X amount of, um, of carbon stored within trees, whatever it might be, you can, you know, you can at least show that. So yeah, biodiversity survey. And but getting people on farm to do that is potentially expensive, but there's plenty of groups that are just so willing to come onto farms, isn't there? You know, using local groups of the local knowledge. Um, but yeah, it's that that is number one that I would say that I still haven't even done on our own farm yet, which is awful. Because I just wanna I'm always impatient, I just wanna get on and do. So I don't wait for stuff. Um, I just make the change and do it. Um, but I'm afraid I can't answer anything else, unfortunately, unless someone else wants to find out. I mean, it's always a, a, a bit of a dangerous... Um, yeah, I'm, I'm quite sceptical about these natural capital um, and payments and biodiversity net gain things. It just feels a little bit like... Um, almost a little bit like greenwashing and... and um, and, and sort of saying, saying, well, it's okay, we can do this over here because someone else has planted a tree somewhere else. Um, it would be great if we just stopped doing all the shit that messes stuff up and just did the good stuff. Um, so, and I, I think, yeah, you can get down that slippery slope where, and I'm sure, like in Wales, there's been a lot of talk about big um, companies buying up vast swathes of, of land just to just to plant up with trees which then like displaces farmers from um, uh, from, from from where they are so so the the, the concept of, of doing it what is it like it's it, it's one of those Pandora's box situations where as soon as you start going down that that route is like do we um, you know put put conditions on it or whatever but I think another one of the things is it's so hard to measure a lot of these things. And I don't think, I think there are so many different um, organizations measuring these things. And I don't think anybody's, there's no, no, I don't think there's one, especially with carbon, I don't think there's one standardized idea of, of what, um, of how much carbon is being stored. And some people say it's being grossly underestimated. Some people say it's being grossly overestimated. So it's, um, yeah, I, th I think, uh, yeah, I think it's, uh, it's a shame, isn't it, that people can't just do it do good things because it's and, and I think what Ruth was saying about how it how actually persuading people that by being a little less intensive you can actually be more productive um, and, and one of our big things being organic is being is being more resilient and if we can show people that that 
by being less intensive, by not having to buy bagged fertilizer, <laughs> by not having to buy imported feed, we're actually, you know, we can actually reduce our, you know, massively increase our, our margins. I mean, I've been really smug just seeing like everyone have a complete breakdown over the cost of fertilizer in the last couple of years. Because um, we haven't bought any in like 20 odd years. I mean, we've just got muck from the cattle and that goes on the veg ground. Um, so yeah, I think it's like, yeah, encouraging people to, to just do the good thing, not just for nature, but actually convincing them that it's, it's good, for their, good for their bank balance. That's kind of like roundabout kind of. <laughs> Obviously, you guys are all really passionate about nature. And I was just wondering, like, what is it that, was there something that started it for you or... Obviously, you're talking about COVID, Ben and the birds, but was it before then? What is it that makes you guys do what you do? Yeah, I, th I think you've got to be a bit of a, a bit of a psychopath not to stand in a field and look at a nice old tree and go, "Wow, that's a nice tree." To to, to look at a tree and go, "Well, that's just getting in the way of my plow." Um, it just seems a bit. And I know there is that obsession, like, and, and both um, Ruth and James have touched on it. That that obsession with tidiness. And my mum's the same. My mum, like, she hates us being organic because she'd love to be out there with a knapsack around her. Um, but, uh, but no, it's just like, no, you can't. You, like, if you want to get rid of that ragwort out of your pony paddock, you can pull it by hand. Um, um, so, uh, so, yeah, I am, like, it, that joy, and as Ruth was saying as well, about the, the, like, the mental health benefits of of doing it and when you start to see the improvements little changes can make and how fast nature can can come back it's it's quite addictive and and i think that that is um you know i yeah i'm probably not the probably not the richest farm probably not the most like you know um su you know successful on, on in terms of gross margins but but i take the way that we do it any day over uh, over profit yeah, okay. Um, to get back to your question, um, to talk, I guess the one thing I have got some experience of is kind of local campaigning. So you're probably doing this already, but keeping really good records of um, interactions with people when you're trying to sort something out, especially if I end up talking to somebody on the phone or face-to-face, -face, I'll follow up with an email with a rundown of what's been said um, so that there's a paper record. Um, I've had combats with national grid around just sending people in and chopping up my very beautifully managed woodland. I've had combats with neighbours doing illegal fells. I've had combats with neighbours on FSC not managing their deer on a landscape scale level. Um, I started off with those sorts of campaigns going softly, gently, and surely the bureaucracy will catch up and everything will go right. I've realised that doesn't work and what I need to do is hit hard, otherwise I waste a lot of my energy. So if something goes wrong and I know somebody's just you know, just done something illegal. I get in touch with them. I get in touch with all the other, you know, responsible land managers. I get in touch with the local press, my assembly member, my MP. I just spaff it out there on everybody and it forces a response and it works and it saves a lot of your energy. It's still a lot of energy. Um, the other thing I've done is just we've made ourselves very high profile. So now when um, the national grid think that they can just sell, send some contractors, mark up as many trees as they like, and they always mark up more than they possibly need to get under your power lines, and then just send random uh, subcontractors to chop their trees. They're not just dealing with me and my partner David Brown and our pretty little woodland in North Wales. They're dealing with the gold medal small woodland winners of the RFS Excellence in Forestry competition. All of a sudden, we're huge. So if you've got something precious on your farm, let people know about it. Stand out there as special. Thank you very much, Ruth. Uh, I'm going to wrap up now. Uh, unfortunately, we haven't got time for any more questions. Um, but on behalf of the uh, Soil, Association, Soil Association and Woodland Trust, I'd like to thank you all for coming. I'd personally like to thank Woodland Trust and Soil Association for putting on this fantastic show and organising uh, some cumbering weather as well. So it's great to see. Um, thank Ben, Emma and Ruth for coming. Thank you all for coming. Um, a quick wrap-up, though. I think Ruth, uh, obviously, incredibly passionate about everything and um, we could have gone on forever uh, and, uh, <laughs> animal, animal health biosecurity healthy land biodiversity resilience people on farms they were my sort of take from that and with ben um just a future in ancient sorry the value in ancient trees and future ancient trees as well we've got to really start looking after those now 
birds in trees, um, birds in hedges, birds in fields, um, and sexy hedges, which is great. <laughs> uh, and thank you very much, Emma, as well, for giving us that. Um, and for me, I think just the, the general... The general thing, really, from, from this and from, from my sort of time within Nature Friendly Farming community, really, is that I'd, I'd actually put, I put it in a couple of days ago into that chat GPT thing, why is Nature Friendly Farming good for humankind? It came up with all the stuff that we've talked about. It came up with biodiversity, with the climate solutions, all the sort of usual stuff. But the one thing that it missed out, and it's the one thing that, that computers and AI can't do, is that it makes us happy. It makes us happy as farmers to be able to get out there and do stuff on the land. So if nothing else works, just do it to make yourself happy. Thank you for listening. We'd like to thank our lead sponsor, Sainsbury's, and our other major sponsors, Farmers Weekly Transition, Forestry Commission, and Till Hill, and all the attendees for making this show such an overwhelming success. To get advice and support for your agroforestry project, either visit woodlandtrust.org.uk forward slash plant or soilassociation.org forward slash agroforestry. <laughs>